Hi, this is Todd Marks, founder and CEO of MindGrub Technologies, coming to you from EduWeb in Philadelphia. I'm here today with Andy Murphy from Siena College in upstate New York. And Andy, what's your role with Siena? Hi, welcome. I am the Associate Director of Marketing at Siena, but also an adjunct professor of, of marketing as well. So I have a really uh, high involvement with our student body, which has been great for, for me in terms of what kind of content do we want to do and how does the student react to what we're serving them. So do you go by staff or faculty? <laughs> I'm technically admin. I tell my students to call me Andy. I don't want to have professor or doctor. I'm like, just call me Andy. I'm one with you guys. Uh, but uh, full, technically full-time employee. I've been there uh, for seven years, and I've kind of climbed the ranks from an intern. And now uh, I'm an associate director. Oh, very good. Did you go to Siena as well? I did. I'm a, I'm a 2017 grad, uh, studied marketing. Uh, in my talk earlier today, uh, I, I told the crowd, I failed math twice in college, and now that's like all I do in my day job. And so uh, my graduate degree is also from Siena in uh, data analytics, which has been fun. Oh, very cool. So you turned the corner then. You... Yes. Yeah. I was the naive 18-year-old, and I said, I don't, I don't need numbers to do Instagram <laughs> or create landing pages, but uh, I learned very quickly that I did. Yeah, analytics and marketing is very important. Yeah. So we're here today to talk about AI in action. Sure. And there's a lot of uh, mixed sentiment at this conference about AI. There seems to be two camps, those that embrace it and those that shun it. Yeah. Which camp are you in at Santa? Yeah, we, we, we see that at Santa, and it's, it's tough for me because I have the PhD scholars who are my department chair, and they're like, we can't use AI in the classroom at all because it's not going to invoke original thought. And then there's Andy, the marketing professional, and I'm like, I love AI. Like I am using it every day and I, and I want to use it in the classroom. So I think it's empowering. I think the student panel was great. They were talking a lot about how they use AI and the college search and how they expect to use it in the classroom at college. So I, I'm very pro AI. Uh, and I still don't think a lot of people are, are using it to their advantage. Yeah. One of the analogies that I give, um, particularly looking in like, you know, creative fields and arts and marketing and stuff. For those that want to shun AI and they say, well, it doesn't invoke creative thought, as you mentioned, if everybody had to start from ground zero without any sort of like understanding or learning, all art would look like caveman drawings, yes. right? But now we have like, you know, Picasso's and Monet's and stuff, and they learned from previous artists. That's exactly what AI does. Right. AI learns from all that previous quality of knowledge. And in my opinion, it is as creative as humans are. And eventually, I think it can be more creative because it learns faster with a wider variety of information, right? It's general AI learns from a, a treasure trove of sources versus, you know, maybe narrow AI, which is, you know, selectively trained on things. So if you look at the creative field, I actually think AI will stand to improve the creativity in that field, you know, tenfold. But the thing is, those that are in the creative field don't realize how much they've learned from others and they feel like everything they're doing is creative. Right, it's original. Hours. It's original, but it's just, it's not. I think about um, like like how we brainstorm. Like I am scrolling on TikTok for hours. Writing in a prompt in, in AI to me is, is the same process, but I'm saving myself probably three hours where I could also be doing other things to advance some of our marketing goals. So it's, it's the same concept. And I don't even think it's remotely close to to cheating or, or stealing or copywriting, I, I think it is as a, as a, as a resource and a, a collaboration, a partner. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, one of the larger institutions near us, Johns Hopkins University, we're one of the first um, universities to come out and embrace AI. And they said it's a tool, just like going to the library and right. looking at other resources. You just need to cite it. Yeah. So if you use AI, right, the parts that use an AI, put a quote around it and say generated by AI. And then they were okay with that. And a lot of the colleges in Baltimore followed suit with Hopkins. Yeah, there's a lot of fa there's a lot of faculty uh, at our school. And my argument is, I was in, I was in grad school, and I vividly remember being in class, and my professor's like, right, "You don't know where the answer is? Like, feel free to go use YouTube." And so I said to myself, "Okay, what's holding them back from saying go use ChatGPT? It's it's literally the same thing." And I just feel like there's a, this misconception of because it's this new technology that we, we can't let our students use it. But I think we're hurting our students because if you're not letting them use it in the classroom, when they're in the job market and they're going out for interviews, they're going to be a step behind 
some of the other industry leaders. That, that's absolutely right. I graduated a few years before you in 98 from undergrad. And um, when I was a freshman, uh, Netscape Navigator came out in 1994. And at the time, we were trying to use it to search for reference material. And our professors wouldn't let us do it. They said, you must go to the library and check out a book. And then you could actually reference the book. But Netscape Navigator was off the table. And it didn't make any sense to me. I'm like, why should I have to physically walk to the library when the same information is on my computer? But they disallowed it. That's very similar to how professors are taking the use of AI and they're just disallowing it without embracing it. And we know they're going to come around because they have to. Yeah, they're going to adapt at right. some point. They are, but they, they need to do it now. The other the other uh, challenge I saw in the classroom, and it, it was AI was newer in the fall to our students, but we, we did a show of hands and I said, you know, how many of you use AI right now or, or know of these tools? And there's only w one or two hands raised. And my initial reaction was, Okay, oh, are, wow. they, are they are they telling me this because they don't want me to think that they're using AI in their homework? Or do they generally have no idea that these tools, these powerful tools are at the ready? So what I did was in my spring classes, I started every lesson with an AI, either prompt or challenge, so they could just become accustomed to, okay, like if I'm stuck in a problem, instead of like getting very worried or nervous, like go use AI and, and help clear clarify some of your thought processes to, to expedite your process. No, that's absolutely right. I, I would have expected 100%. I know, to me go too. Off. Yeah. I mean, it took us a little while at, at MindGrub, but everybody uses AI in every discipline. Our engineers are doing co-programming with it or pair, or pair programming with it. Our marketing team is, is using it to generate a lot of content, images. You know, I've had to be a little bit of a leader pushing on the use of AI, but now every department's really embracing and they're sending me weekly reports on how they're using it. I love it because it's creating a lot of you know, um, efficiencies within the business. Yeah, so I used to write a lot of ad scripts for us. And I'm like, my focus right now is on the analytical side. So our video producer, I'm like, like, Dave, you should use AI to write the scripts. Like, it's going to save you a lot of time. You can spend more time editing. And the other side, in my, in my lesson planning, I used it a lot. But when I was teaching the analytics class, I was trying to find these data sets and these databases online. It would take me hours to find what I was looking for. And then I was like, I'm just going to use the Excel plugin and I'm going to build these data sets because I know what metrics I need. I know how I need it to be formatted. It's going to take me two minutes instead of four hours. And I can go out being a, a 30 year old out in, in, in Albany and I can, I can live my life and I've drastically cut down my time for lesson planning. Right. We happen to use Google, but they also have a plugin yep. as well to Google Sheets. But the, you know, Copilot plugin to Excel, it's brilliant because all those formulas, you know, how to do pivot tables yeah. and everything. Now I can just go to the bot. You can say, this is what I want to do. It's like, got it. And it just does it for you. And it's like, that's yeah, amazing. I've, I've been seeing that in, uh, in Google Sheets where I'll, I, I do an insert pivot table and it's like, here are seven options that <laughs> would work for you. Right. I'm like, this is great. I, it's so efficient. So aside from the classroom piece of AI, and that's wonderful that you're starting every classroom, how are you using it on the marketing side for Sienna? Yeah, so a, a lot of it is on the content marketing uh, as well as like content auditing. So I'll, I'll, I'll take a, I'll take a landing page and I'll, I'll ask it, um, can you audit this for me and make me 10 different recommendations or, um, and the audit in terms of like for SEO, for S SEO, uh, user experience, um, like navigational. And so, you know, I'm 12 years out of college and like the way I look at a website is not how a 17 year old is looking at a website. So I'm trying to train and say, Hey, you know, can, can you use this technology to, to help me make these optimized landing pages? That's going to work for us instead of me going in there doing it manually. Oh, that's amazing. Are you using it to um, do any of your banner ads or paid media at this point? Uh, in terms of like our, how we want to structure our budgeting, um, we do a little bit of that, but in terms of like creating a banner ad, uh, not for the final product, but for the initial like creative storyboard, like we do a lot of storyboarding with AI. And so, um, we, we do a piece it's called Saints Go Marching. It's very, it's like a long form news piece. And I'm, our coworker Dave was in Budapest and he goes, can you write me a script for seven Siena students in Budapest? And it wrote it and he like plugged in some of the B-roll footage and he was like, this just saved me so much time in writing and editing. Yeah, we've started to use a tool called beautifully.ai. Okay. And um, you could 
tell that the ads were made with AI. And it's not really AI. It's more like template based and it's, you yep. know, automation of creating banner ads and stuff. But we had a client, we want to do some paid media around, you know, washing cars. And um, I use it as a case study to go to our interns. I'm like, we need to create a lot of media for particular zip codes, right? So it was, it was very much a production thing in that we had an existing example and then they just need to kind of mass produce it. But instead what they did is they took that one banner, they basically recreated beautifully.ai and then they were just able to programmatically have it generate all yeah. the verbiage for all the other zip codes and it saved hours if not days. Yeah, we've done some uh, some work on the uh, organic uh, social content stuff. I've used it to repurpose long form video and uh, short 15 second films. But uh, we also just used it last week. Uh, I needed to, uh, it's called the Palio race and it's a horse race in Italy. And it's like very tight to what we do at Siena. I said, I don't have any imagery of the Palio race and I need it in a, in a 16 by nine ratio. I need it to look like this. I need space up top for text. I need to have quiz and gamification on it. So it did it in like two minutes. And I'm like, my coworker, I'm like, Emily, you got to use this. Like, instead of like design something in Photoshop from scratch, like I did this right. so quick. And what software did you use for that? Uh, I used Dolly. Dolly. Yeah. Yeah. I've been using Dolly and Mid Journey yep. and Dolly now is free and co-pilot. And we were doing a, um, a pitch for Jeep and I wanted to have this activation where people could sit in a Jeep, put on like a, a MetaQuest and have a driving experience, but they're just, they're sitting in a concert hall, right? And so my prompt was draw the shell of a Jeep that could be packed up in a box and moved to a venue at a conference, reassembled and show a individual driving the Jeep with a MetaQuest on and an audience in the background with all their phones out taking video and posting on social, right? Like very specific, nailed it, Yeah, nailed it within a minute, right? And that otherwise would have taken us probably a week with several cycles and back and forth, right? And then even if it didn't nail, I can say, that's pretty close, but give me 20 variations. One minute later, 20 variations, right? Just the speed is just impeccable. Yeah, in terms of like the scale, we um, a year ago, we started to test it out and I saw a little bit of some demos from the keynote last night uh, in terms of like the Spanish speaking and all that. We did uh, an email blast, I think probably 15,000 of our admitted students. So I said, congratulations on your acceptance. And instead of doing 15,000, hey, Johnny, hey, Sarah, hey, Elizabeth, we used AI and voice technology to do this, what they thought was a customizable personal video email to them, but it was all done through AI. And the oh, amount wow. of replies we got back, that was like, thank you so much. Like, I'm so thrilled. And like, they just thought it was a human. Right. And it, it worked really, really well oh, for what us. What tool did you use for that? Uh, it's a company out of Canada. I, I, I don't remember. Um, we were like a test pilot for them. And we, oh, so we did, we, did, we did three different demos with them, three different tests with them. And, and it was it was awesome. I'd love to hear about that that tool after the fact. We've been using a tool called Synthesia. Okay. Um, but the post-production time is long. Okay. So if you wanted to customize a video and, you know, say 15,000 different names at the front of the video. Yep. The production time would yeah. still be a long time. I haven't seen something as quick as what you're describing. Yeah. So what basically what happened was they gave, they gave us a script, and it was it took 30 minutes on camera to do the script. But through all these different voice inflections and voice movement, like if you read that script, they were able to whatever name you had in your database, they were able to lip and and vocally match it pr pretty well. I, I definitely want to find yeah. out about that company. Yeah, it sounds like they're a step ahead of others. Yeah. So where do you see AI in? Five years, it's a trick question because it's moving so fast, but I love to ask it because I get some really interesting uh, yeah, answers. Yeah, we talk about it at Siena a lot. And uh, we, in, in the higher ed landscape, we think it's going to allow our admissions counselors to do a, a lot more work. Like we, we want AI to read our application because reading an application for a counselor takes 15 minutes where they could be doing other work. So I think um, we're going to heavily use it at Siena uh, in terms of our marketing focuses. I, 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 I truthfully don't think it's going to replace anybody's job. I may be naive in saying that because you still need the, the human theory and brain to, and to do these prompts. Um, but I, I'm excited. I, you know, I just saw what, uh, what is it Wendy's that they're doing a AI surge pricing. So based on when certain customers are in the store buying a certain item, their prices are going to change. I saw a bar is going to be doing that. I think it's on like the Jersey Shore. They're going to do like AI search pricing. And so I, I think there's so many benefits to it. And you, you got to get on board now or you're really going to fall behind the eight ball. That's absolutely right. Yeah, we, we built Wendy's app 
And the way we built it is we first went around and we basically interviewed like urban, rural, lower, upper socioeconomic and got all their feedback. What do you want to see in Wendy's mobile app? And it was the same three results. They don't want to wait in line anymore. They don't want to have to use cash and they don't want to have to order a numbered meal. They want to make it, if you want to put a frosty on a burger, so be it, put a frosty on a burger. Well, in building the app out and making this highly customized app, um, we also realized that the price of a slice of tomato is different at every single restaurant, yeah. right? They get this stuff local and however much they have to pay, they then have to charge. And so as you add all these items to your mobile device, let's say you're driving down the highway, it doesn't know which store it's going to be at. So it would give you estimated pricing. And then when you hit the actual um, restaurant itself, then that geofence would then lock in the actual pricing and it would update the pricing on you. So it's really encouraging to hear that it's not just based on the geofence of which restaurant you're at. It's actually based on the, so the demand and the supply, yeah. right? I mean, it's, that's just, that's brilliant. That's a great use case for AI. And I think, I think as consumers, we need to embrace it. I still see so many people like afraid to go to a kiosk and they want to order from a person. And I'm like, that's not the way of the future. Like, to your point, do you want to be stuck waiting in line? No, I want to get my groceries. I want to get in my car and I want to go home. And if you can, if the, if the consumer, if we can educate the consumer on, okay, AI is going to have all these benefits. I think it's going to have great impact on economic factors, uh, societal living factors. I think there's, there's uh, endless benefits. Yeah, and I, I'm a firm believer that we need to displace, not replace humans. So, you know, mundane, mm -hmm. repetitive tasks, right? That's where AI and robotics can come into play. And that frees them up to do higher and better use case. Um, driving up here, I stopped off at the, the Welcome Center in Delaware. And most of the, you know, the quick service restaurants there were only kiosks. So they didn't yeah. have humans at the register. I happened to go to Burger King. Don't tell Wendy's, but I went to a Burger <laughs> King. And it was all kiosks, and they only had two people. They had one person who was basically bagging the food and another person who was doing all the cooking. And this is a rest stop. Yeah. Like this is big, it's busting. big throughput. Yeah. yeah. It was busting, right? And they had about seven kiosks, which otherwise would have been seven people ordering food, right? Or taking orders. But there's no way that you could have had just had, now they would have all bagged the food. So maybe that second person could have been in the kitchen, but where they would have had to run it with nine, they ran it with two humans before, yeah. right? But hopefully the rest of those seven humans are now doing higher and better use case of their time yep. stuff. Maybe they're, you know, coming up with new recipes. Maybe they're, you know, figuring out new ways to prepare the food, but they're not just ringing people in all day long. Yeah, I think there definitely needs to be some type of like uh, enhanced training in a lot of these companies. Like we're not taking your job away from you. We're, we're modifying it. Right. And cobotics. Yeah. Yeah, that's what we call it. It came from industry 4.0 in the manufacturing industry started to put robots on the, you know, on the factory floors. And then they have these huge data centers where somebody else would be looking at all the data and they'd see like, oh, well, this piece of equipment's pulling a lot of electricity, so probably the blades doll, right? Then they'd run out to the blades doll and replace the blade, and then they'd run back to their big room. Well, what they figured out is in industry 5.0, if you pair the humans, the data, and the robots together real time, it creates the most efficient output. So now they, in manufacturing, they call it cobotics, but you look at AI, we're calling them bots or robots, yep. even though they're not like mechanical robots, but it's all about that cobotics. And I, you know, I think it is going to, you know, greatly increase our productivity. Um, you know, the hope is that it leads to us being able to have a better work-life balance, right? Exactly. Because I remember, you know, we used to write letters to grandma on Sundays, right? And now I can just text grandma, yeah. but I don't know that our relationship improved, but now I text her, you know, several times a week, not yeah. just once on Sunday, right? So I think it's increased the the amount of work we have to do, but I don't know that it's increasing the, you know, that balance yeah. between work and life and health and wellness. And so I'm really encouraged that if we get it right, um, that it can, you know, go back to increase, increasing our, you know, standard of living. Yeah, have a great work-life balance, but you're still making revenue. And I think that's what AI can do for us. Yeah, absolutely. Especially if it can work while we go to bed at night, right? Yeah. <laughs> Well, Andy, it was great talking with you. Yeah, I really appreciate you coming and joining uh, MindGrub team at yeah. EduWeb. And, Thank you so much. You know, looking forward to hearing about that Toronto company. I'd love to use Definitely, that Definitely, man. Cheers. Yeah. Thank you. You got it.